Well, thank you everyone for joining us here in the afternoon. Hopefully you've had a chance to get some more coffee because it's one of those days where a little caffeine helps push us over the edge. A little bit of sugar. And our job is to make all that investment in calories worth it by sitting down and listening to us to talk, have a conversation around small cells. I am actually delighted to be on stage here today with uh, three guys who really are going to be able to talk into detail about what's happening here. Um, we're going to start introducing with Mateo here from Proximus. The, he will talk a little bit about what Proximus used to be and what they're seeing and, and things of that sort. We'll kind of go down the line and kind of then start the conversation around what's interesting to them, but also interesting to you as the audience. So come with questions and we'll have a conversation. Mateo. Uh, Proximus is um, formerly known as Belgacom, is the incumbent of uh, Belgium, so Brussels, for those who, of you who are less familiar with Europe. And uh, it's a typical uh, fixed and mobile converged operator uh, with an infrastructure on the fixed side, which is mainly today fiber to the curb and vector VDSL. And on the uh, radio part, of course, the uh, LTE has been deployed as it's delivering on the promise. Uh, and we also have a, a very uh, dense uh, Wi-Fi network, which we um, uh, deliver today out of our uh, modems, out of our gateways. So on the access side, we're pretty co well covered, and, uh, and we're now looking also at small cells. That's the way. Especially for the infrastructure. Pedi from Qualcomm is going to talk to us about what the t t chips that enable this whole thing. So, Sure. Thanks. Uh, hi. My name is Pedi. Uh, work for Qualcomm. Uh, you guys may know Qualcomm is a leader in chipset for handsets, but within uh, the big Qualcomm, there's a small business that that, that runs the small cell uh, chipsets as well. So we, we, we've been uh, in the small cell chipset business for many years, uh, working on chipsets for 3G, LTE, across working with different OEMs across residential enterprise. Uh, and outdoor small cells. So we're now in our third generation of small cell chipsets. Along with the chipsets, we also have a lot of research activity, um, and, and that's driving a lot of innovation in small cells in the areas of SON, LTE and license, and, and so forth. Thanks. I mean? Uh, hi, my name is Ahmed Jain. Uh, I head up marketing and product management at Spider Cloud Wireless. SpiderCloud builds an enterprise small cell system uh, which is used to deliver uh, 3G and LTE coverage, capacity, and new services to enterprises and large venues. Uh, we work with a lot of large operators. Uh, our announced deals include Verizon Wireless, Vodafone, America Mobile Group, and, uh, and a few others. So. so think about the... Who here has had perfect cell coverage everywhere they've been their entire lives? That's what I thought. All right, there's venues in which, you know, subway tunnels, uh, downtown Mountain View, California. There's all these places where we don't quite get the coverage that we expect. And the promise of small cell really kind of helps to get to that. Um, I was even at an event RCR Wireless did several years ago about even in hotels and things of that sort. And small cell's been supposedly the answer to all this. We're seeing this kind of grow more and more in people's hearts and minds. What's what are you guys most excited about this? I mean, obviously you guys are thinking about it from a carrier standpoint. Is this, it's both not only quality of service to the customers, but also new revenue streams. What's, what's driving this in your mind? Um, interesting that you mentioned uh, coverage. Coverage is uh, the first requirement. Uh, so the first opportunity for small cells. I mean outdoor small cell, or small cell in public domain. Outside from the enterprise domain, but in public domain, where you're normally uh, dealing with an environment that you don't control, an environment that where uh, you need to have a, an operating model to take care of those cells, those small cells. You, you want to make sure the performance and you know the, the, that they are safe as a, as an end point of your network. So, the coverage is a fundamental driver that we see because finding macro sites today, new opportunity for macro sites, is very challenging in an environment where uh, electromagnetic restrictions are uh, growing. Uh, Brussels in particular had, uh, still has one of the toughest electromagnetic restrictions in, uh, uh, in Europe and probably in the world. And we, could, I mean, we had to re really lobby to relax a bit to deploy 4G a couple of years ago. But we also see coming, you know, uh, certainly if we want to cover or to densify basically small cell as an opportunity. But today is a coverage opportunity, whether it is certainly in the public domain, 
the challenge is to, uh, to make an operating model, including backhaul and maintenance that makes sense uh, from an OPEX perspective as well. And then, you guys at Qualcomm are enabling all of this at the chipset level. What's been, especially in these kind of crowded spectrum situations, how do you guys handle that? Uh, uh, so I think uh, on the spectrum, so I think one of the things that we're looking at is, is uh, LTE, uh, driving LTE in, in other uh, spectrum regions, for example, LTE and unlicensed. But before I go there, I also want to yeah. comment a little bit on the, on the coverage question earlier. So that's how the in industry got started. Uh, you know, back 3G uh, femtocells, the, the main uh, need that was driving that was providing adequate coverage indoors, uh, in, in, and operators use that extensively both in U.S. and, and Europe and, and other parts of the world. But what's interesting for now uh, is that we're going through that phase where small cells sort of is, is evolving to, to, to solving what we see as a capacity challenge, right? So the, the need for cellular capacity in addition to coverage has also been uh, growing exponentially, almost doubling every year. So what small cells does there is it provides a very unique way of deploying uh, new infrastructure at lower cost than what has been conventionally possible and thereby en enabling service providers to provide additional capacity to meet the needs of their subscribers. And that, you know, further uh, coupled with innovations in, in technology such as SON, which makes the deployment of the small cells easier and thereby take the, the deployment cost um, uh, it reduces the deployment cost. That that makes it even more uh, more attractive. So that that evolution is is what we're seeing. I think going forward, small cell may you know also have potential to evolve further because you know there are many other applications that small cells may may potentially uh, enable. One of the things that small cell uh, you know provides is is some information about the location of the user. So you can think about oh, right. applications in the retail space or enterprise space that small cells may enable. So I think we're going through that phase where we're evolving from a coverage driven industry to more capacity focused and then you know eventually hopefully towards a more application uh, driven deployment. Excellent. I mean how are you guys at Spider building on this from a platform standpoint, especially when you're looking at uh, enterprise and or these kind of venue locations in which you've got multiple carriers who are trying to serve customers there, but then you have these other types of uh, on-prem services that Panit just talked about. How are you guys enabling that transformation? So, so, so our, our, our normal business model is to sell our product to large wireless operators and then help the wireless operators go and win uh, new enterprise customers and then sell them you know, the, the basic services, the basic voice and data services, and then other value-added services on top of it. And we've always felt that, uh, like we've talked about small cells and what they can do, but there has to be a business benefit that it is bringing to the carrier. Right. Uh, a lot of big operators want to go after uh, corporate subscribers because the, the ARPU that you'll normally have uh, when you're selling to enterprise subscribers is much higher. Uh, the stickiness is much higher as well. I mean, there are numbers uh, from that several operators reported which would claim that often less than 15% of the subscribers of an operator are actually enterprise subscribers, but these 15% can contribute as much as 30% of their revenue, and, and they are sticky. So how do you actually go out and win these high-value subscribers? And the thing that they are looking for is that if I'm going to pay the operator so much money, I'm paying them like 50, 100, 150 dollars per month per subscriber, I need to have consistent high quality service in my enterprise. Otherwise, why am I going to work with this carrier? So, so that is where we come in and we help the carrier build out this system in this enterprise, acquire those subscribers, retain them, and once the operator has our uh, small cell controller that we call the services node inside the enterprise, then that opens the door for the carrier to be able to say, well, now that you have this small cell system, let me show you what else I can do. Can okay. I do content filtering? Can I do location-based services? Can I do content caching? How can I help and how can I add value to your business? So, so that's the overall proposition that we are bringing to the, um, to the enterprise market. Excellent, okay. So ends, and on the venue market, because that ends up being sure. uh, slightly more complex, doesn't it? Uh, 
So again, our we, we always look at the carrier as our as our as our customer okay. and see how we are solving the carrier's problem. Okay. So I think Matteo had mentioned earlier that there's a big need for capacity in a lot of public public places, but a big problem in public places is how do you how do you do site acquisition? How do you you know? Uh, so th that is normally the big blocking factor. Now what we are doing is, uh, uh, let's say when we. We'll help, the we'll help the operator acquire a venue, so you can go into a large, a large building, could be a large hospital, a hotel, a shopping center. Uh, our system deploys just like Wi-Fi, so it deploys over the existing Ethernet LAN, so that reduces the pain point for the venue. Practically every venue right now has an Ethernet LAN. They right. need it for running their own business, for doing Wi-Fi, so the carrier can go in and say, look, no new cabling required, I don't require a huge space for installing a DAS system. I don't require a ton of power. Just let me ride on your existing Ethernet LAN and deploy 30, 40, 50 access points inside the building. Our view has always been that you shouldn't think of small cell as one base station, but always think of it as a system. Mm -hmm. so, 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 not, so a lot of other people are trying to solve the problem of how do I deploy a single small cell. Okay. We are looking at the problem of how do you deploy a large system of like 50, 100, 200 small cells inside the same building. And if you can actually deploy 50 small cells inside a building, you can actually take thousands of subscribers off the macro network, right? So we have buildings in, in, in downtown London where once the carrier deployed our system inside the building, they took 2,000, 3,000 subscribers off the macro network. So this is almost like adding a new macro base station in, in the middle of London. That's the same effect you're having. And right. this is otherwise almost, an, it's an impossible thing to do right now. If you want to add a macro cell site in the oh. middle of London, you can't do it. No. But if you can go building to building, like London is packed with high-rise buildings. And if you're going building to building, Convincing the building that allow me to put a 50, 100 access, 50 to 100 access points inside the building. Take, every time you do that, take two to 3,000 people off the macro network. You've added a tremendous amount of capacity. So, so that is how we are approaching the venue market. Make it easy for the venue. Make it incredibly attractive for the carrier. So Bring you, them together. So you have the one-two punch. You have short-term cost savings because you're lowering your OPEX uh, for minimal CapEx because you're living on the existing lands. But then you're giving them a platform to then start to offer value-added services on top of that? Absolutely. How does that seem to a carrier? I don't want to say it's a no-brainer, but <laughs> no, it, it's actually, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense. In, in enterprise space, it's really the challenge is to secure the location. Uh, you fiberize the location, and if, as you fiberize, I mean, it's not enough. You want to bring the best connectivity, which is wireless, and also Wi-Fi, we should not forget it. And uh, by doing so, you, you get to, I mean, to, to cover the entire uh, business location, and this is, allows you, for instance, even sometimes to replace legacy DEC systems uh, through VoIP, uh, which certainly in some uh, situation like healthcare center is still today uh, an important presence. And, and you can package and you can add the values in terms of uh, servicing, okay? that's important. But you know that the, the small cell is actually in a protected environment, okay? And you, you can definitely uh, create a, a value proposition which is attractive and with a good degree of stickiness. The challenge is in the public domain. You need to mine your network. You need to data mine your network. Uh, and that is, that is a, a, a challenge that we are taking on. We are looking very much very close and deep into our network to find the sweet spots where we can deploy outdoor small cells, which is we, we expect to deliver superior performance because video is coming, is coming uh, and is actually filling the network. Uh, and there is no way with video, to, for a sustained video experience, you need to densify. How do we do that? Just to add maybe something to the discussion. We have uh, uh, a system of probes which allows to, to uh, really see the uh, density of traffic per kilometer square, and we know that the, the, uh, the I don't remember right the numbers, but the, the head the head of this distribution is 200 times in terms of traffic per year than the tail. So you, you can do that, and if you map that, and if you map the GDP density per kilometer square, you have a simple equation. So where is GDP density? Is also traffic density. And that is the opportunity for our door small cell. We also compare with Twitter density, and guess what? We get the same picture. <laughs> so we are data mining our network to find those we call sweet spot that we will try and convert them in performance zone. And there, I think the idea is then to market the superior experience. 
we are not there, we are not yet there, but we are preparing ourselves for that. We, we want to make sure, and I insist a lot for our outdoor small cell, the, it's not about finding, uh, having deploying the technology, it's about finding the location, finding the electricity point, Okay, certainly backhauling, which has to be fiber, if you want to make good experience, and having that under control. So you don't want the, what you save in terms of capex for a macro side, you don't want, to, you don't want to lose in terms of opex because you have to go there all the time and fix issues and things like that. But it's definitely along this way that this is the second step. So after the coverage is about you know, performance at the point of demand. So and ability to, to sustain a, a tremendous amount of growth. I have to say that, you know, <laughs> forecast, in the past we used to make forecast of traffic and recent we saw that a forecast we made was not that good on the positive side. So, <laughs> meaning we, <laughs> we saw a difference on the, for once on the positive side. So it's a challenge that we're ready to embrace. We understand today technology is there, but certainly uh, uh, it's not yet to the maturity level. So we, we, we're going to take a very stepwise approach into that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. That makes total sense. Questions from the audience. I mean, this, how often do you get a panel like this? Sir. Yeah, he's, he said he'd uh, answer questions, so we're going to. Yeah, thanks. So, Great presentation, appreciate it. I'm Ken Rabin from 451 Research. Um, so small cells do a great job addressing coverage. For example, you know, we saw that in 3G. With Volte coming online, it's going to become critical for operators to have excellent data coverage as well as the traditional circuit switch coverage. But we also see companies like SpiderCloud coming on with some interesting possibilities for hosting applications that leverage that small cell ecosystem. Operators have not traditionally been terribly brilliant about taking their offers out to the enterprise customers. Uh, Matteo, what do you see your challenges in trying to bring this extra value out to enterprise customers? Do you have to change your organization culturally? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I think, let me say it's about time. So, but it's, time is a very important factor of that. So, uh, so you have to build awareness. If, if, you're, if you're referring to values added services that you can do on top of pervasive connectivity, today I tell you that achieving a pervasive connectivity is the number one priority of our business customers. And then they are happy once you solve the basics, because they call it basics, eh, right? When you solve that and you make them happy, because these buildings are, uh, well, Faraday a cage, yeah. and uh, new buildings, so you have excellent macro coverage, even with 800 megahertz, which is pretty strong. But then inside, you have to build that the same value. 4G makes the difference. In the past, 3G, I mean, the experience was that good, but 4G, if you move from 4G to Edge, I tell you, the customer call, you get it. The, the customer says what, what's happening. So pervasive co coverage and, uh, and a good capacity, it's the basics. Value added services. Well, we're talking about here indoor public domain, so shopping malls. So definitely I've heard about geofencing. Uh, I've heard about you know, uh, call to actions, but I've seen that in slides. In reality today, I see many, many, uh, very, very few cases of actually those things being deployed. Uh, Wi-Fi is still a king in that. So, but there, I think, let me say one thing. So, Wi-Fi is an important component. It remains important, and I think you know a good deployment of small cell has to take Wi-Fi along. It's an opportunity. It's definitely not a complex. It's an opportunity. But in terms of those value added services, we have to evangelize. We have to see them. We have, they really have to make a difference. So we're not yet there. Huh? So I, I just want to. I just want to mention one point and make sure everybody noticed what Matthew said earlier and also part of, uh, partly in this uh, response. So I think what he said, the challenges is in, in the data mining, figuring out where to deploy the small cells mm -hmm. and, and how to get power and backhaul. I think, so it's, it's a sort of validation of the work that the industry has done over the years, right? So it, it was not like that a few years back. Operators worried, worried about deploying small cells, managing the RF power, setting up the neighbor list, managing the mobility parameters, and all that stuff. It was a truck roll, a lot of investment to go and deploy any base station. So the industry, you know, uh, silicon vendors and also uh, the small cell OEMs have now brought the product uh, maturity to a level where the challenges remain, the, the three that he mentioned. So I'm, I'm actually very happy to hear that. That sort of is a proof point. Uh, I'm, I think Amit, Amit will agree with this, and 
Do, do you agree? Have you, have you seen that uh, level of evolution in the maturity of uh, small cell products? <laughs> Yes, um, we are looking forward to see also how Sun can help in that uh, area, but uh, we would, would like Sun to help us on the macro network first, because if Sun can, can improve the performance of the cell edge, we would all be happy, and we can save some OPEX there too. So I would like Sun first to, to realize the promise on the macro network. Today, you know, it's all about that you get off-shelf product, but it's the learning part, which which we don't have to underestimate. So learn how to use these tools. We have deployed uh, technology that help us to monitor every single customer performance on mobile, and we're still learning how to use it. There's a foundation for that, which, which uh, helps us already today to, to do this data mining. But uh, yeah, the technology, it is, of course, more agile in the sense that you, you can use a, a cloud system or you can use a way to abstract from the access gateway and, ma and work with that. But I think the, the, we are making, I would say, important steps towards that, but not yet there. So, uh, and I think it's, it's also by some, some other market may be ahead of the curve. An important factor, which I never, uh, we should never forget, I mentioned before about acquiring site location also for small cell. Regulation is very different across the geographies in Europe, and in Belgium, also between the, the Flemish and the French-speaking part, there are some permits or no permits. Uh, yeah, it's still, wow. still operationally, still not a given. So that we have to work on the basics first. That's I want to make sure. Oh, we have 17 other questions. This is great. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll make sure you're next, I promise. Don McCullough, following up on Ken's question. How does a small cell operator compete with Wi-Fi? It's there, it's inexpensive, it provides connectivity. I think uh, that seems to be one of the questions is how do you, how do you come in and, and compete with Wi-Fi in an enterprise network? Well, I'm going to piggyback on that one and actually ask the question of how do you either compete or collaborate with Wi-Fi, uh, especially when you think about hybrid networks. So, so uh, we actually don't try to compete with Wi-Fi and there is nothing like a small cell operator. So if you have a small cell system in, the, in a building, you wouldn't even know that there is a small cell system in the building. That is the, that is the whole idea of doing a proper small cell deployment. If you choose to remain on LTE, you remain on LTE. If you choose to remain on 3G, you are on 3G. If you choose to remain on Wi-Fi, you can get onto Wi-Fi. The, the value out here is giving the, the end user, the subscriber, the choice of uh, technology and the bearer that they want to be on and not have to keep on making choices as to, wow, I rented a building, where is my little Wi-Fi knob and I need to, um, to turn it on. Uh, secondly, on working with Wi-Fi, I mean, uh, we, uh, uh, we have a partnership, with Spider Cloud, we have a partnership with, uh, with, with Cisco, and uh, we actually have taken our small cell and turned it into a, a, a module that actually plugs, to, plugs into a Cisco Wi-Fi access point. Okay. So if you're one of those enterprises that has uh, an Aeronet Wi-Fi access point, and there are millions of these out there, you could get a Spider Cloud module from Cisco and uh, Cisco will be able to offer you both uh, LTE, basically LTE, 3G, and Wi-Fi in the same package. So we're not trying to compete, we're trying to offer a complementary solution. So just to add to that, from a you know, silicon company's perspective who has both Wi-Fi and LTE yeah. solutions, I think there, I, we don't see that as a competition also. I think Wi-Fi has a tremendous ecosystem of scale uh, and cost that, uh, that's well ahead in, in terms of the optimization that they've done. For, for different use cases. So, so I think what we look at is both LTE and Wi-Fi, this sort of serve diverse, uh, you know, they are both needed to serve the diverse set of requirements and, and use cases out there. So Wi-Fi uh, satisfies quite a few important use cases within the homes. They have, they're embedded in a lot of devices within the homes as well. LTE, on the other hand, provides uh, mobility and, and the security, security and, and the QoS that comes with the LTE network. So both sort of are very complementary and so there are different tools that, that the operator uh, will have to in, in order to meet different uh, requirements or, or scenarios. So then at what point in time does it become interesting to you as Qualcomm to put Wi-Fi and small cell on the same chipset? So I think that's, that's really a, a level of a integration question. I mean, they, they are in the same product today. You look at any has smartphone, yeah. they have both LTE and Wi-Fi. You know, it, a, a, a big portion of the 
of the functionality is offloaded to the main processes, you can see that that integration has already started to happen. Now, the level of integration is really a question of of the wa you know uh, the volume of the respective industry. Wi-Fi derives a lot of cost advantages from the large volume it has outside mm -hmm. of the cellular. Uh, ecosystem as well. So you're going to lose those benefits if you combine them into a silicon, right. uh, same silicon. So it sort of becomes uh, that trade-off. So, so I think uh, we'll have to see how that uh, plays out and what's that point where it makes more sense to sort of have them in the same silicon and versus uh, you know, Separate, tightly uh, integrated as Yeah, because one plus one isn't always two. Some, you hope it's seven, but sometimes it's just one. You had a question in the back. First question. Oh, that's it's a village. It takes, yeah. Yes. So it's related to that actually. In for macro base stations, the refresh rate is probably five to seven years, possibly. But in the mobile devices, it's every year. So where is the refresh rate for small cells today? Is it evolving? Is it speeding? I, I mean, you mentioned you know debating between uh, combining Wi-Fi and LTE, probably because the refresh rate is not quite there. That's why you're debating. Question. So I, I, I don't think there is one answer, and I'm feel free to chime in here. I think if you think of small cells, there, there, there are different categories of small cells as well. You know, you got residential small cells where you, it'll be shorter, the refresh rate will be shorter because the consumer device, it's, it's shipped to the, uh, to, 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 uh, to the home of the subscriber and subscriber sort of installs the product uh, himself or herself. Whereas, you know, the refresh rate would be a little bit longer for enterprise products and even longer for outdoor products and sort of, you know, once you go higher at the micro uh, small cell uh, level, it, it may be the same as what you would uh, typically see in a, in a macro uh, environment. Yeah, we design all our products um, with, for like a five to seven year, so macro style uh, useful life. We also offer like a, a, a full roadmap of software functionality in which we keep on every year building more features onto the products that we are supplying. So it's more like, uh, it's, it's more what the carriers would expect from uh, their macro base station vendors. What if you have, uh, let's say um, you're in a building and you got more tenants keep coming in, then how do you increase the capacity in that way? Because small cell is supposed to help people. Yeah, that's really easy. You can just add more. Add more small. Cells. You add more small cells to add add more capacity. That's that's sort of the advantage, sort of over you know Matthew. You mentioned at DAS earlier systems, which were more coverage focused. Small cells sort of gives you that flexibility to add more capacity quickly because you add more small cells, you're able to reuse the same spectrum, and and serve more users. So that good question. There was another question in the audience. Somebody had their hand up. Actually, you had a question too. Did I get answered, or we'll get him then? Hello, um, my name is Jane Lee from Nokia. So maybe a question for Amit, uh, who is uh, <laughs> uh, also we are familiar, very familiar. So still about indoor enterprise. So I, I'm in the office, and uh, we have very lousy T-Mobile coverage. In the in the in the old days, I would go to T-Mobile, complain about, and I get a new small cell installed. But now I'm on Google Project Fi and Wi-Fi uh, works perfectly, and my caller ID use experience just like cellular. So how do you convince me to buy a cellular small cell nowadays we have service like this? So his, his, his question was, T-Mobile was terrible. They put in a small cell at health, but he's on Google, Google Fi, which means as long as he's got Wi-Fi, he's got great coverage. And how, do you, how does that, is that wave of what Google's proving out with Google Fi and offloading onto the Wi-Fi networks, how does that change in the landscape that you guys see for small cell? Is that a, yeah, okay. So, I, I, th I think if you have great Wi-Fi coverage, you have a, you know, you have a QoS enabled high quality Wi-Fi network inside your building in which your enterprise has already invested. You've got voice over Wi-Fi capable phones. Your enterprise IT has no problem in supporting all your subscribers, so let's say your Wi-Fi phone doesn't go, your call doesn't go through, you call up your IT guy, he's very responsive, he comes and fix the Wi-Fi access points. So if all that stuff is working, you actually don't need an LTE small cell from an operator. The thing is that most uh, enterprises actually don't have that luxury. And they do rely on their uh, service providers to provide them high quality consistent service. They don't want to be in the business of running their own, uh, basically running a QoS enabled high speed network. 
So it, it depends. I, I don't think that any technology is a solution for all problems. Uh, we're solving one problem and others are solving others. Uh, just a small comment uh, on that. I think, it's, uh, I think the question is, is a very interesting, but the answer is never compromise on a very good mobile coverage, never. Uh, we have 150 parameters that we measure every quarter about our mobile coverage. We simulate context, so we know exactly context, I mean whether it's transport, or whether it's in your home, uh, whether you're making calls or receiving SMS, so we have a very, an excellent view of the performance and we keep on investing. That's the best answer to your point. Now, in the enterprise market, uh, and also let me add that we have one Wi-Fi hotspot in Belgium out, out of 10 people, okay? We still see an LT mobile data growth and the calls are better to be in a mobile network, trust me. So in, excellent, in, in a synthesis, if I may say, I mean, uh, I think you keep, we keep on focus on our business and we, our customers is best answers to what we do, their level of satisfactions, which I don't think Google is gonna check all the time, by the way. Okay, yeah, actually what we've seen in our data and looking at how consumers are reacting to the Google Fi experience is that they're having the experience that you have indoors, but the minute they move outside, outside of that, those good Wi-Fi, they're... Let me say one. Can you hear me now? No. Just an example. Do you remember the phone boots? Do you want your communication to be back to a phone boots experience? Uh, you can only make calls inside this small box called your cubicle. So that's the difference uh, on mobile versus Wi-Fi. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, that's great. And with the phone booth, and oh, we got one more question, then we'll... Sean hasn't told me to be quiet yet, so. So, Matteo, what I heard is, what I heard is that you're still, the carriers are still kind of hesitant, you know, to do trials and things like that. Um, potentially, with the unlicensed band open up the five gigahertz, what prevents a garage guy who's, you know, less risk averse to basically become a provider? Because when it's unlicensed. They don't need to go FCC. They don't have to be certified, whatever. They could just drop something in there and with LTEU and Wi-Fi and become a provider. Would that be a risk to the carriers? Interesting question. Um, yeah. Yep, yep. Ah, LTEU is not does not work that way, yeah. But three, so this is gonna be, I think, potentially turn into a religious conversation, which is best handled at the break. But we'll let Matteo have one, one stab at it before we move into that, but it's a good question. Um, but this way, that is an cross. opportunity for us. Let me turn it the way I, I like to, things to be. Why? So uh, we do a lot of analysis and a lot of survey amongst our customers. And do you think mass consumers make a difference between Wi-Fi and mobile? It's internet, that's what they know, okay? Fine, great, so if we are able to, with a strong LTE network, to leverage unlicensed spectrum for capacity enhancement, or as long as the quality uh, does not deteriorate, that is op an opportunity. Okay, still some times to come. Also, uh, there are technologies out there that, that let to bundle Wi-Fi and LTE, uh, and multi-path TCP, for instance. Uh, so we will use the full spectrum on LTE, and we'll use the full spectrum on Wi-Fi. And as long as when that comes into a device, that is well, access virtualization. So you don't really care. What, what matters that you have your customers, and the customer sees your brand, and the customer buys your product every month because they pay the bill every month. And it's important about satisfaction. So that is, a, but it's not only, connectivity is one part of that. Also, we should not never forget. It's about services, it's about local presence, it's about gravity, yeah? so also. That's great. And with that, I would have to say thank you to the, these gentlemen for their time.